time. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to welcome each one of you. Thanks for taking your, your time to come and uh, become better acquainted with opportunities um, and life as we delve into disabilities. I'm Jean Carfora. I've been a member of DAT for about 20 years now. And uh, you can tell that's definitely where my passion is, caring about individuals. Next, please, Amy. Amy is uh, going to be moving through our, <clears throat> excuse me, moving through our uh, slides. And the diversity action team is pleased to have six partners uh, for our programs. And each one of these groups does a great job of sharing uh, a better understanding and the respect of each other. So Hedberg Public Library, YWCA, UW-Madison, Division of Extension, Rock County, uh, Beloit NAACP, which welcomes all of us, Social Justice, Edgerton, and League of Women Voters. So we thank you. Um, we feel it's easier to embrace some things when you better understand them. So we believe love, not fear, must be our guide, as Rosa Parks once said. Next, Amy. One of our DAT committees is Allies of Native Nations. Thus, we share our commitment to our nation, our Native forefathers. And I'd like to share this, this slide, land acknowledgement statement. We would like to recognize that we are meeting on the ancestral lands of Native nations. In Wisconsin, there are 11 federally recognized Native American sovereign nations and one seeking to regain federal recognition. We acknowledge these indigenous communities who have stewarded this land through the generations and pay respect to their elders, past and present. Thank you for that strong statement. Just a, a couple of guidelines. Uh, there will be questions, I'm sure, throughout the program. So if you do have a question, please write your questions in the chat portion of the Zoom. And you can find that chat uh, symbol down at the bottom. We're asking everyone to stay muted, especially Billy Bob. If you have any comments or questions during the presentation, feel free to share in the chat portion of the Zoom. And I also want to comment on the fact that if you have a question uh, or a comment, that you would like to remain anonymous, when you put that question in the chat, just send it directly to Santo. And I'll be able to share that uh, anonymously. So, it is my, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Ms. Denise Jess. She will be sharing her insights concerning delving into disabilities. I'd like to share a little bit about her. She's a pretty amazing person. Um, Denise is the CEO and Executive Director for the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired. She continues being a strong advocate for the disabled communities. Her participation in a multitude of state organizations reflects her action, reflects her passion in the areas, especially transportation and voting. So with that, Denise, I would like to share, turn the program over to you. 
Awesome, Jean, thank you so much for the warm welcome. And thank you to, to all of you for coming tonight. I'm really uh, excited to see your uh, list of partners and very much appreciate that you have a land statement honoring uh, the indigenous people who walked this area first and the impact of uh, white uh, supremacy on their lives today. So thank you for starting in that way. Uh, I am thrilled that the Rock County Diversity Action Team has invited me to speak a little bit about disabilities. People with disabilities are one of the largest uh, marginalized or minority groups in the country. And we're often a group that gets very little opportunity to really speak to our experiences, both individually and systemically. So uh, it is really exciting to have this opportunity. And I have to say, I'm really, really proud of the work that you all are doing in you know, creating a space tonight for this conversation. So I'll introduce myself and then Amy, I'm happy to let you know when to switch slides. So thanks so much for bringing up the presentation. So I, uh, as Jean mentioned, am the executive director of the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired. I am also a person who lives with vision impairment. I have been legally blind since, uh, since birth. So this is a 50 year, almost 59 year experience for me. I am the mom of two daughters, one of whom is 20 and one of whom is 23. And my wife and I have been together for over 30 years. Um, and I am somebody who, when I'm not working, uh, loves to be out in my garden and loves to knit. Um, this time of year, it's particularly wonderful to knit our first really cold day of the fall. Uh, and someone who loves to cook and bake. I'm a sourdough baker, um, in addition to just loving to work with fruits and vegetables. So I'm also, I'll give you a quick visual um, uh, description of myself for those who may have um, difficulty in seeing the screen. I'm a silver blonde haired uh, older woman, 58 and blue eyes. I'm wearing a um, cobalt blue shirt. And I realized when I saw the poster that it's the same shirt that's in the poster. And I am uh, relatively light complected. Now, that intro might be a little different than what you might have expected. And it was quite intentional. I took a moment to give you a visual description or an image description of me, because for folks with vision impairment, oftentimes we don't know what the people who we are conversing with look like. And so having a sense of that is a way of creating greater inclusion. You know, everyone else gets to see the people who are in the room. Uh, but without some form of visual description or image description, we are learning about folks in other ways, like through their voices and through you know, the things that they tell us and the stories. And we're remembering that and making mental notes of it. But it's really nice to have a sense of what that person might look like. The other part of my intro that told you a little bit more about me beyond just my job and my um, vision impairment, but all those other aspects of who I am, I included because often as a person with a disability, folks see me single dimensionally. Meaning that once they know I have a disability, once they know I have a vision impairment, that becomes kind of the central focus of our interaction. And I am so much more than my disability. You know, I'm a mom, I'm um, a, a wife, I'm a knitter, I'm a baker, I'm a gardener, um, I'm someone who loves to read. And so what, that's one of my invitations as we're doing our work tonight is to remember that folks with disabilities are far more 
than um, our disability alone. And when we're encountering folks with disabilities, to really remember our wholeness and not just focus on disability. So Amy, if you're ready, you can go ahead and advance the slide. I wanna tell you a little bit about the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired, uh, just in case you're not familiar with our organization. And since Richard is one of your members, I can't help but think he's probably mentioned uh, the council a few times, but for just to level the playing field, I wanna make sure that we touch base on the council. So we will celebrate our 70th anniversary as an organization next year which is really a, a great source of pride for many of us. Um, our mission, we're a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to promote the dignity and empowerment of people in Wisconsin who live with vision loss. And we do that in three ways. One is um, through advocacy, education, and vision services. The dignity and empowerment part of our mission is really, really central. And we are the Wisconsin Council of the Blind versus for the blind, because we not only um, have many members of the blind and visually impaired community on our board, we also have many members of the blind and visually impaired community on our staff. And we have the privilege of partnering with other folks, other sighted individuals to, to really facilitate and run our organization. So we are visually impaired, led and governed. We have three key values that guide every bit of the work that we do. Um, and they are inclusivity, integrity, and uncompromising respect. Amy, go ahead whenever you're ready to do the slide. So let me talk a little bit about what um, disability looks like in the state of Wisconsin. Um, I mentioned when I first started out that we are one of the largest uh, minority groups. In the state of Wisconsin, nearly 1 million people identify as having a disability. So that's one in five adults. These, um, these numbers really just focus on adults. I chose to not put children into the mix for tonight, um, just to focus on our adult population. Um, so uh, uh, disability is quite prevalent. We know that these numbers are likely underreported because many times folks won't indicate that they have a disability for a couple of different reasons. Sometimes um, they just are like, well, I, I am getting older, so things are harder for me. And so they don't necessarily consider themselves a person with a disability. And also because there's still a lot of shame around disability in our culture, folks can be really uncomfortable admitting that they have, dis that they have disabilities. We have folks who get very hesitant about seeking out our agency simply because we have the word blind in our title and they don't want to be considered blind out of fear that their friends and family will potentially love them less or take pity on them. As we age, we are more likely to, um, be, to have a disability. So those um, of us who are age you know, uh, 65 to 74 are 22% 22 um, of people in that age group are likely to have a disability. And as we get even older, 75 or older, 42%, so nearly half of our oldest adults our folks with disabilities. So the prevalence of disability in our, in our communities is so incredibly, incredibly high. In the blindness and visual impaired um, community, we guess that there are between 100,000 and 200,000 Wisconsin adults um, with vision impairment. And again, we know those numbers are underreported. Um, so we guess that the numbers are really closer to 200,000. Okay, Amy, go ahead. So 
people with disabilities in general experience um, some of these things. And I'm gonna go through each one um, with a little bit more detail. So we are more prone to experiencing higher rates of unemployment. Right now in the state of Wisconsin, I think our unemployment rate is just under 4%. I didn't check it today, but last week it was just hovering just under 4%. Among people with disabilities, it's about 40 to 50% unemployment. And with certain disabilities, the rate of, under, of unemployment is 70%. People with vision loss uh, typically experience the highest rates of unemployment. So that means only 30% of our population are folks who are employed. Of that 30%, many folks are underemployed, meaning that they're not working um, enough hours for uh, full-time work or they're working at um, wages that are uh, low, or they may be working in fields that don't match their level of skill or training. And we'll talk a little bit more um, as we go on tonight about why those rates of unemployment are just so incredibly crippling high. It stands to reason that with such high unemployment rates, those of us living with disability are more prone to poverty, twice um, the level of poverty that is true for our uh, non-disabled uh, peers. And we experience significant health disparities. So, um, you know, anything from being potentially more obese to having higher rates of diabetes and heart disease, we're more likely to smoke. Um, the rates of depression um, and anxiety among people with disabilities are also um, extremely, extremely high. So we'll talk more about what causes this in the next slide. Great, thanks, Amy. So our, so it's not just kind of like some dumb luck that people with disabilities face these extra barriers and uh, of unemployment and you know, poverty and health disparities and you know, many other things. And it's not, a, it's not a flaw in our characters. It's not that we don't work hard enough and it's not that we're incapable. And those are you know, some of the uh, stereotypes and beliefs that many of us with disabilities face on a regular basis. But the reality is just like systemic racism and systemic homophobia and systemic um, sexism, a, uh, people with disabilities face uh, sets of beliefs and uh, practices that devalue us as human beings and that look at us as somehow needing to be fixed or in need of help. And that sense of someone with a disability being broken or needing fixing leads to a belief um, consciously or unconsciously that somehow we are less than uh, our, our peers without disabilities. And these sets of beliefs are really rooted, they're called ableism, and they're very much rooted in fear. One of the things that um, Jean, you said as you were talking about um, the diversity action team was you know, really confronting fear. These weren't your words, but this is how I heard them and uncovering fear and really learning so that we can come from a place of love and letting go of fear and having fear not be the controller. And, uh, and that really touched my heart as you named it because ableism is rooted in fear. Fear that um, someone with a disability might not um, measure up to our expectations, fear that it will cost a lot of time and money to connect with someone with a disability 
and frankly, the bottom line fear of maybe becoming disabled oneself. You know, we've heard the phrase a lot of times in our lives, there by the grace of God go they, you know, so kind of the, um, oh my gosh, pitying people with disabilities. So let's look at how this um, fear plays itself out in everyday um, reality for those of us with disabilities. So thank you, Amy, I see you advanced it, perfect. Um, one of them is attitudinal. And we've talked a little bit about this already, but in the employment sector, one of the things that we often hear from folks is, well, I don't know that I want to hire someone with a disability because I'm not sure how they'll function in our workplace. Like, will they be able to use the microwave to make their lunch? And will they have friends? And will they get along with their colleagues? And are they going to be able to do their work? Or are we going to have to do their work for them? These are things that we hear on a regular basis from um, employers about you know, some of their concerns about hiring someone with a disability before they've even interacted with folks with disabilities. We hear um, attitudes of, well, I'm not sure I can be a friend to them because what can they have to give? So those attitudes, even in 2021, are still alive and very well. Communication is another barrier. And in this time of living on virtual meetings, which is how I feel like I spend the majority of my day in front of a screen, there are many communication barriers for people with disabilities. So I was so delighted when I found out that you use Zoom as a platform. So I want to, um, a meeting platform. So I want to give you kudos for that because of all the virtual meeting platforms, Zoom is the most accessible. It has built-in features that make it more useful for those of us with disabilities to be able to fully engage in the process. So it removes some significant communication barriers. Other communication barriers that people with disabilities face is you know, not having closed captioning. And so anyone with a hearing impairment you know, becomes uh, less able to, or maybe unable entirely, to be able to connect and communicate. Not having sign language interpretation is another barrier for communication. Um, another barrier is physical barriers. And this we've spent a lot of time in our society talking about. It's probably the one that gets most attention, you know, thinking about is someone able to get into a building? Are they able to move about in the building? Are they able to get to and from the bathroom? Are they able to get into the polling place and other places where, you know, folks need to be able to have physical access? And we still have a lot of physical barriers in our society. Policy is another form a barrier that faces people with disabilities. And I was so delighted when I saw that the League of Women Voters is one of your uh, partner organization because the League has taken some really positive steps to help reduce barriers to voting for people with disabilities. They're excellent, excellent partners of ours in the disability world. So I wanna give them kudos. But there are policy things all over the place that limit the access and the rights of people with disabilities. Voting is a prime example. In the state of Wisconsin, we do not have an accessible absentee ballot. So what that means is for any of us with a vision impairment or anyone who cannot read um, the ballot because of a learning disability, or if English is not their first language, the um, ballot comes to your home in paper format and I can't see it to be able to vote it. And so if I want to be able to vote my ballot from home versus going to the polling place, 
I have to ask someone to do it for me, which compromises my right to a private and independent vote. So I have to find someone I trust who will read me the ballot accurately, who will mark the ballot accurately, and then who will um, you know, help me get it into the certification envelope and help me to sign it. Um, very disempowering process. Just imagine turning your ballot over to someone else to mark it. And there's lots of policies um, that really exclude people with disabilities, but that's one that comes to mind right away. Transportation is a huge barrier. We are a car-centric society, meaning that we don't necessarily build our communities to be um, accessible by public transportation. I know, for example, in the city of Janesville, I don't think you have bus service on Sundays. And so it really limits for anyone who does not drive or cannot drive or cannot afford a car to be able to engage with the community, to be able to get to Sunday services if you, um, you know, are spiritual in that way, to be able to get together with family, to be able to do shopping. Um, and transportation is a huge barrier. And when we think about all the ways we use transportation, all the ways we use our cars for those who can drive, we get to work, we get to go shopping, we get to medical appointments and other appointments. We um, get to go visit friends and family. We get to participate in community activities. And when public transportation is reduced or non-existent, then we're not able to participate in those basic things. Um, programmatic barriers exist um, in lots and lots of different ways. If kids don't have access to their materials in their chosen format, or they can't take a regular course um, of study that they would like to, those are programmatic barriers. Social and environmental barriers, um, there's lots of those as well. Often times people with disabilities have smaller social networks. And so often we're over tapping our social networks to ask for help when we just maybe wanna be able to hang with friends, but now we have to ask a friend to help us vote, or we have to ask a friend to help us get to the grocery store, or we have to ask a family member to help with this or that. And so it stresses our social um, networks and sometimes even makes them smaller or decreases them. The criminal justice system, um, there are more people, it's disproportionate, um, number of people in the criminal justice system with disabilities. Um, I was doing some work with uh, police uh, a couple of years ago, a few years ago. Uh, they reached out to us to find out what they could do to build a strong relationship between the police force and uh, people with vision impairment. And one of the officers shared with me that based on my vision impairment, I have a lot of rapid eye movement, um, that my eye movement presents the same way that someone um, who has overdosed on opioids presents. And that was shocking to me because I could be misperceived as um, an opioid addict um, based on my rapid eye movement when really all that's happening is my eyes are moving because of my visual impairment. And one of the last ones that I'll mention is that there's a medical model of disability. So, um, and that's where the idea of needing to fix someone who has a disability comes into play. So Amy, you can go ahead and advance the slide. So um, since you all are the action team, I'm so excited to share with you the really concrete things that you can do. And many of you, I'm guessing, are already doing this. So four, four simple things, but they really are big work. So one is keep learning. You know, there's so much awesome stuff to learn about people with disabilities and um, the disability movement and the history of disabilities. Please keep learning, find your interest and go with it. 
bring a, a filter of inclusivity. You know, so ask the questions, like when you're planning these meetings, who might not be able to come because of how we've set up our meeting? How can we make our meeting more um, accessible, more welcoming for people with disabilities? If you're out in your work world asking questions like, wow, this has got really tiny print on it. Could we make this bigger so it's accessible for someone? Um, or wait a minute, you know, just this whole policy that we're thinking about really disenfranchises certain people and um, gives more privilege to other people. Recognize barriers when they exist and call them out to help remove them. You know, that when you see something, say something is really, really powerful. Um, folks with disabilities, when we have our allies in you all and you're helping to raise awareness and lift us up, that is so incredibly powerful. And we're so grateful for that. And then the last one is to, dis is to support disability organizations. You know, many disability organizations like mine and others are nonprofits, and there is very, very limited funding for the services that we provide. So those gifts um, allow us to continue to do our work. So um, Amy, you can go to the next slide. So what I want to share in, in the um, as we as I finish up is a portion of a video. Um, and this video was created a, a couple of years ago, actually about a year ago, for uh, sharing with doctors who are op, um, ophthalmologists and optometrists because they so often apply the medical model of disability in their work. And we um, are so fortunate to work with some doctors who are really wanting to change that status quo. And they're wanting to humanize um, their, uh, their patients with vision impairment. Oftentimes what we'll hear from doctors um, after you know, they, they see us is, you know, there's nothing more I can do for you. And what we want them to say to their patients who have significant vision impairment is, well, maybe there's nothing more that can be done medically. There's a whole lot that can be done by supporting someone in learning new skills and really helping open up the world. So this video was created um, for medical professionals to really help them understand um, the tools and resources that are out there for helping people to live full and vibrant lives. And I didn't include the whole video, I just included a portion of it, but you'll see me in the video just going about my day normally, kind of take me out of the talking head that you've been listening to for the last you know, 25 minutes and put me into the real world. So Amy, whenever you're ready, if you can click open the video, that'd be awesome. A day in the life with Denise Jess. Hi, I'm Denise Jess, the CEO and Executive Director of the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired. I'm the mom of two adult daughters. Amy, and I'm not able to I see it. We celebrated yeah, our we're not seeing the video. anniversary. I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat? Yeah, we're not seeing the video. We're just still seeing the slide. We're hearing it fine. Hold on. There we go. A day in the life with Denise Jess. Hi, I'm Denise Jess, the CEO and Executive Director of the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired. I'm the mom of two adult daughters, and my wife and I recently celebrated our 30th anniversary. I'm an avid reader and knitter, and I love to cook and bake. I was born with an underdeveloped optic nerve and consequently have been legally blind since birth. I have no light perception in my left eye and the acuity in my right eye is 
20 over 400 with very limited peripheral vision. Come join me as I share with you some of the vision rehabilitation skills that I've learned over the years, as well as the many accommodative tools that help me to live my life to its fullest and most vibrant professionally and personally. A lot of my day is spent in front of a screen, whether it's composing email and responding to it, working on documents, and these days, attending meetings. I use a computer program called Zoom Text Fusion to help me do my computer work. Fusion has both magnification and screen reader ability. Important dates, deadlines to register for November election colon. If I were to only use the magnification portion of assistive technology, I would experience a lot of eye fatigue. The screen reader element helps me be able to uh, stay more relaxed, be more efficient and more effective and experience less eye strain. Bulleted context menu, cut T. Because a lot of things come to me, not necessarily on the computer, but they come via paper. Things like financial documents and legal documents, as well as check signing and my mail. I use a desktop digital magnifier, also known as a CCTV. I also have a portable one that I carry with me for in-person meetings and to do at-home tasks like read the mail or read a recipe. The digital magnifier, when I put a document underneath it, will increase the size of the font for me. And both my portable and my desktop have OCR technology. This means I can take a screenshot of the document and have it read to me using voiceover. To get to where I need to go, I walk, use public transportation, or use rides sharing services. Crossing the street is definitely one of the highest risk and most dangerous activities for walkers and commuters who are blind and visually impaired. I worked to advocate for an accessible pedestrian signal at the intersection outside of our building and partnered with city officials for its installation. Yellow lights are flashing. At the end of a busy day, I love to unwind by doing some knitting. For me, knitting is a tactile activity. My fingers can read the stitches and I have the muscle memory and my hands know just what to do. After a full day of needing to use my vision, it is so soothing to me to be able to do something that is purely tactile and to create something that's really beautiful. When I do need to use my vision in my knitting, I wear 8X power readers and I use really good lighting. My lamp can transition in its level of brightness and can change from white light to yellow light, depending on my needs. Thank you so much for joining me for just a little portion of my day. I'm hopeful that this helps you to see how really high quality vision rehabilitation skills and the appropriate accommodative devices help create greater access and ease in my life as someone who is visually impaired. Made possible by Vision Forward Association and the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired. A Day in the Life with Denise Jess. Awesome, Amy. Thank you so much. 
So that is it for me. Um, I'm happy to um, respond to any questions. And, um, and yeah, I'm happy to respond to any questions. And um, I'm hopeful that tonight's presentation gave you something to think about in your advocacy and equity work. Thank you. So I hear the chats in um, my headphones. I don't see them. So um, thank you so much for um, that feedback. The feedback was thank you for the awesome presentation. So yeah, any questions from anyone? All right, so Jean, I will turn it back to you and I will stay on so that if questions arise as folks um, go along, I'm happy to um, entertain them as well. So I'll turn the reins back to you. Thank you, Denise, so much for sharing. That was a Extremely. Oh, great. Jean, there's a great question that just popped up in the chat. So I'd love oh. to, um, I'd love to respond to that. So how has uh, my life improved with technology? And what are my hopes for the future? So awesome question. So yeah, technology is incredibly helpful um, for me, you know, the being able to, um, um, being able to do the sort of work that I want to do, which is highly um, demanding visually, um, it could be, um, is really accessible because I have computer technology that um, I can use for doing just about anything that I need to. The caveat that I'll say with that is that the technology is expensive. And um, currently, there are very few um, pairs for that technology. So I have the you know, for, good fortune of working for an agency that supplies my technology. And I have the economic flexibility um, because of the wages that I earn to be able to purchase technology that I need personally. Um, the, um, Services like Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance do not fund any of the technologies. You know, anything from um, a simple handheld magnifier to, um, you know, more expensive technologies like the CCTV that you saw in the video or even um, screen reader technology to install on the computer. None of that is funded through um, any form of either public or private insurance. And it's expensive. The um, CCTV that you saw me using is about a $3,600 piece of equipment. Um, so given the level of poverty um, that uh, folks face and the lack of financial support, many folks go without that technology or are using technology that's quite antiquated and, um, and breaks quite a bit. So um, my, my hope for the future is that we continue to reduce barriers to that technology um, you know, when we're talking about things like Medicaid, you know, advocating for Medicaid expansion in the state of Wisconsin is really, really critical so that we can continue to do the work to see if we can get Medicaid to cover some of these technologies. So, yeah, my hope for the future is that we continue to reduce the barriers to access to technology. So awesome question. Thank you so much for asking it. <clears throat> oh, sure. Um, uh, there was just a um, question to explain the filter of inclusivity. I love these questions. They're awesome. So bringing a filter of inclusivity for me means that I'm holding an awareness of people beyond myself when I'm making decisions. So um, I'm looking at the world through the filter of disability, you know, thinking about people with disabilities, 
I'm thinking about people who racially differ from me. You know, I'm holding on to the awareness of what I know when I'm making decisions. So for example, when I'm making decisions about um, hybrid workplace in my, in my agency, I'm thinking about how do we develop our policies so that they are inclusive or they work for as many people as possible, you know, like folks that are chronically ill or folks that have transportation barriers. Um, if I think about um, a meeting that we're gonna host, how do I look at that through the filter of inclusivity? Are we holding it in a place if it's a in-person meeting that has public transportation access or that feels safe to someone to come to that place for a meeting where they'll feel welcomed? Or if we're doing a meeting virtually, is it on a platform that people can access easily enough? Can we turn on closed captions? You know, is it one that's a simple enough technology for people to learn so that they don't feel like they um, they can't you know unmute their mic and be able to say something or put something in the chat column? So that's bringing the filter of inclusivity that it, that that folks beyond just the people that I'm most comfortable with are always on my mind and thinking about how do we create something that reduces those barriers? So that's a wonderful question. Thank you so much. Oh, these are great questions. So how has the ADA changed my life? Um, you know, there's a lot of promise in the ADA and um, it's a piece of, um, legislation and an act that I'm, I'm proud of. And I have so much gratitude for the folks who fought hard to get it. And it's insufficient. So um, many of the provisions of the ADA are difficult to enforce. So the ADA doesn't have a lot of teeth. So there's really great parts in it, like reducing physical barriers to buildings. And, um, and you know, new buildings have to have those things, but when they don't, when buildings don't have them, it's really who do you report it to? And there's such a, um, there's so much cumbersomeness for reporting um, an ADA compliance issue that often folks just kind of throw in the towel because it's, it's just not easy. And it takes litigation often, um, you know, lawyers and, uh, and energy and resources to be able to, you know, have an ADA complaint actually change something. Folks with vision impairment were pretty underrepresented in the ADA as well. And I'm grateful because there's been new web accessibility guidelines um, put into place. Um, and again, difficulty in enforcement of those, but those web accessibility guidelines, which is a supplement to the ADA, have really helped open the door on accessibility of websites and, um, you know, and technological um, implications. So I'd love to see the ADA go, have us go beyond the ADA, particularly in things like voting and, um, and other, you know, public access um, things. Uh, so it has a, it has definitely changed my life, but we still have a long way to go in creating um, access for all people with disabilities. And Denise, what do you feel we could do as interested um, participants? How could we be advocates for that ADA? Um, I, I, I think really, um, looking at your community through the through the eyes of someone with disabilities and you know raising um you know raising awareness um with your city council and um with your schools you've got a city council that i find to be really receptive um, they are among the um organizations or the city councils across the state that Oh, great, I'll do that question in just a minute, accessible absentee ballot. So um, they, they're really receptive to our annual pedestrian safety and white cane message. So I think you've got some folks on that city council who could really be good 
um, listeners and sounding boards, you know, thinking about your transportation. Well, that's not an ADA compliance issue. It's a big one for your residents in Janesville who are people with disabilities. Um, you know, looking at your public access buildings, how easy are they to get around? You know, is the disability um, entrance in the back, you know, kind of like a second class citizen has to come in the back. So, you know, walking around your community with eyes wide open about how, how might someone with um, a disability um, feel and, and, and have access and starting to have those conversations um, amongst each other and with your elected officials and with your friends and neighbors, just to really help lift up. No, the, yeah, yeah, I'm hearing some great questions in the, um, in the uh, chat, so <laughs> I'm loving them, these are so fantastic. So one was on what would make a ballot more accessible, and so I'll do that one, and then I have a great question about uh, the legislature. So um, what would make a ballot more accessible in Wisconsin would be to have it be able to be emailed to, um, to someone who requests it and have it be what's called tagged so that my, our screen readers can read it to us. And then we can mark it um, and then, you know, preferably be able to just send it back electronically. We're probably a long way from that, but to at least be able to print it and then be able to send it back. And Wisconsin has the technology and the capabilities to do that. We can send ballots electronically and we do already to our military and overseas voters. Um, so it really requires the legislature to change the law so that we can do that same provision for people with disabilities. Um, you know, other ways that, you know, Jean, in response to your question, you know, other ways that, um, you know, UL can be really actively engaged is to pay attention to a lot of the voting bills that have been floating around the Assembly and Senate. Many of them were vetoed by the governor because they had such serious implications for voters with disabilities especially around indefinitely confined voting and nursing home and care facility voting, but really keeping, you know, voting is something that interests you, really partnering with your members and friends from the league to, you know, to stay really abreast of those bills. Um, there was a great question in the chat about has the state legislature become um, more accessible? Um, you know, we have a state legislator who has some um, pretty significant health impairments and who's also a wheelchair user and who is running into quite a bit of barriers um, in being able to uh, join meetings electronically. And um, no, uh, it, it, simple, um, simple statement. Um, these days, um, hearings on bills are still being held in person in the Capitol um, for a while. Many were being held um, virtually via Zoom, and it really removed barriers for many of us to be able to testify at those public hearings, both for safety during the pandemic, but also because we didn't have to, we didn't have to arrange transportation. Um, to get to the hearing, and especially for folks who are not in Madison, that you could simply click a Zoom link and be able to testify at a hearing. So having those go away and go back to in-person hearing means that those legislators are getting less opportunity to hear from the diverse citizens of the state of Wisconsin. Great. So largest contribution, what has been the largest contribution to myself and to the community? Hmm. It's a great question. I think, um, I think small steps like this, this, this is what, what you all are doing tonight is important. And I, I want to really emphasize that. Um, having real conversations and having experiences with real people, um, opening hearts and minds, 
Um, you know, I'm as happy doing this as I am testifying to the legislature um, because it's these moments that slowly chip away at attitudes and beliefs that simply need to dissolve. And um, so I can't, you know, and I just, and I have to say that folks who came before me who were disability advocates, I'm so grateful to their bravery. So um, yeah, I don't think there's like one single thing. I think it's the real and human interactions and the advocacy work that has come before that I'm really, really grateful for. Great, so fantastic. What do the conversations with youth look like? Um, so um, especially as they get ready to um, transition into the, um, as they get ready to transition out of school. So um, a lot of the conversations really focus on self-advocacy because self being a really good self-advocate is critical to our success. So not waiting for someone else to advocate for you. So uh, a lot of the conversations we have with them is how to recognize when you have a need and then how to articulate that need and how to get to the person or people who can address that need. So, you know, for our kids in our population with vision impairment, it is not waiting until the semester starts to talk to your instructors, but getting in touch with them or the learning center on your campus to get the materials you need in your accessible format so that on day one, you're ready to start your classes. Otherwise, what happens is you put your request in for materials in the format you need, whether it's Braille or large print or audio, and you get weeks behind because you didn't have the materials on day one. So it's one of the biggest things we talk with them about is advocacy and, um, and really learning how to do it because your parents aren't going to be there to do it and your teachers aren't going to be right there to do it for you. I heard a question in the chat about um, accessible pedestrian signals, but I wasn't able to hear it. Can somebody just um, say it out loud for me or read it to me? Denise, it says, is it true that most crosswalk crossing signals don't work? Well, there's, there's different kinds of signals. And so ones for people with vision impairment that simply light up, you know, for obvious reasons, they're not helpful. Um, but they, you know, because we can't see when the walk light is on. So um, advocating for accessible pedestrian signals and those have a tonality to them. Um, you heard the one uh, maybe in the video um, when I pressed it, it said, you know, walk light is on and then it said it in Spanish. Other ones will say, you know, um, walk light is on to cross and it will say the street name. I think ours says the street name too. Um, or before you hit it, if it's not safe to cross, you know, if the light hasn't changed yet, it will say wait. There's also, when you press the button, there's also a tactile, there's a, um, a vibration that you feel. And the one that you saw in the video has a locator beacon. It beeps so that um, I know exactly where the signal is and know where to reach for the button. Those are amazing. And they have been shown to reduce um, accidents involving um, people with vision impairment because we get that auditory input. Otherwise, what we're doing is we're listening for the, the traffic patterns. We're listening, are cars still passing? in front of me, you know, or are, is it parallel to me? If it's parallel to me, then I'm gonna assume it's safe to cross. If it's still hearing the cars passing in front of me, then I know I need to wait. When I can use that accessible pedestrian signal, then I've got another piece of information. And, you know, a lot of research shows that we leave the curb sooner, 
Uh, we don't confuse drivers as much because drivers are like, is she going to go? Is she not going to go? So um, those are really, really helpful. So advocating for those in your community at places where they're going to be really helpful, like outside your city council building um, or other high pedestrian traffic areas is really a powerful thing. I heard a question about electric cars. What was that one? Oh, well, I just want to say something about your response uh, to the crosswalks. And I think this is something that each one of us could do when we're out and about in the community, just to double check. Uh, and that would give us the, uh, and you're right, we have a, a, a city council that does a pretty good job of listening. So. Mm -hmm. I, I think that there, if there are issues with the crosswalks, they would respond. Yeah, and if they aren't working, you know, that your, your public works department really needs to know about that. Mm -hmm. Also, if you're light timing, because it takes longer for people with disabilities and elders to get across the street. So if your light timing is really too short, um, you know, and you can't safely get across and you get stuck in the median or you're, you know, you're really having to rush, um, then that's something to report to your alder um, and your public works department, because in some cases, that signal timing can be adjusted. Can you tell I serve on the Transportation Commission? I really can get <laughs> very, um, very weedy about things like light timing. <laughs> I want to be really mindful of time too, because I know I'm sharing time with other folks. So, Jean, you tell me when we need to when we need okay. to stop. I'll let you know, Denise. Would you tell us how long those signals should last? It um, I can't because it depends on how many lanes of traffic there are. So they um, there are rules about them, and I don't know the rules off the tip of my. Um, tongue well enough, but um, there are rules, but then there are some flexibilities within the rules, particularly at high, um, high traffic areas. So um, I, I don't know precisely, but okay. if it feels too short, it's time to say something about it. Okay. And uh, we had a question about electric cars. Uh, are they an issue because you won't be able to hear them? Yes. Yeah, they're terrifying. Okay, I bet, I bet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Katie has a question about what advocacy items are you working on currently? Cool, great question. Um, in a nutshell, because um, you could give me two hours to talk about these, but in a nutshell, um, I'm very excited because I co-chair a Wisconsin Department of Transportation sponsored non-driver advisory committee. And we are looking at statewide, um, how can we make some changes in statute and in policy and in funding for um, greater transportation access in the state. So that is always something that is top of mind for us is transportation advocacy. Um, we're also working on the accessible absentee ballot and working on making sure that we don't have laws passed in the state which would actually suppress the rights of people with disabilities and elders to be able to vote. Um, we're working on trying to increase funding for the offices that live within the Department of Health Services that serve people with disabilities. So the Office for the Blind, the Office for the Hard of Hearing and Hearing Impaired, Deaf and Hard of Hearing, the Office for people that are um, deaf, blind, and the Aging and Disability Resource Centers, because those are traditionally underfunded. Um, you know, uh, they haven't seen funding increases for about 12 or 13 years. And with inflation, that really means their funding has decreased, while at the same time, the populations have continued to increase. And so we know that without giving proper funding to those necessary services, we are looking at um, a health crisis not too far in the future because when you have a disability, you know you are more prone to having other um, other health issues, and one of them being falls. Wisconsin has some of the worst falls-related injury data in the country, 
and people with disabilities are more prone to falls. So we really need to see our public health dollars increase so that the services are there for people with disabilities and our elders. And the disabilities and also the um, uh, financial uh, help for people that are visually uh, impaired. Well, any, any disability, um, but I don't think the funding has come through has been increased for quite a few years for those individuals either. Am nope. I correct? Mm -hmm. You are correct. We have not seen funding increases at the federal level or the state level for people with vision impairment uh, for about 12, at least a dozen years. Yeah, that's something that needs to be addressed too. Yeah, yeah, it, it does. Definitely. Okay, well, you're right. We are. Um, working to stay on time and thank you so much. We really appreciate uh, your word, your insights and your words of wisdom and you have given us a lot of food for thought. Thank well, you. Thank you. Is it okay if I stay for the rest of that presentation? Oh, yes. Okay, yes, fantastic. Definitely. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, Amy, um, we're going to have a, uh, an interview with uh, Richard right now. So can we go back to the full screen? Thank you. All right. Um, Richard, I see you. You do have my name, but not my face, Richard. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, you, you are uh, almost a lifetime resident of Janesville, and you've been uh, and and very active part of our diversity action team, especially with the planning committee. And so I have a couple of questions that I would like for you to answer. And uh, if anybody else wants to jump in, we have a few minutes. Richard, my first question is, how does your vision loss impact your daily life? <sighs> <laughs> Well, uh, can I, am I unmuted? You're unmuted. Okay. Mm -hmm. For one thing, um, it of course limits to, to um, it limits me as far as some transportation. I don't take as much transportation. Um, <clears throat> it limits me, um, I was going to say cooking, but since I don't cook, <laughs> because the way you're brought up helps influences your life and my parents never let me do a thing in the kitchen and I think I've developed fears and my my wife does all the cooking which is fine with me but I operate the microwave <laughs> um, it affects my um, as far as of course as far as reading I can read books and braille and audio but since I'm not can't read print, that's quite a limitation. We have somebody read our mail once a week. Uh, if I'd learn how to use a device that reads the mail, I'd be better off, but I, um, I'm afraid of the iPhone. Um, I was gonna comment that we have in Janesville, there are two talking stoplights at Randall and Racine in Maine and Milwaukee. They say the name, they give you the name of the street. And when the name of the street is said, you cross the street and you have 20 seconds to cross the street. And between that, they'll say, wait, wait, wait. And then it says, it'll say Randall or Racine or Maine or Milwaukee. Um, but I also, um, <clears throat> I think it impacts my life on communication because. Uh, I don't get as many emails, I, I don't communicate with people as much as I, I normally would. I'm not a big phone user and um, my, the person that I talk to a lot passed away because of the virus. So I don't talk to many people as I used to. And it also impacts me as, um, I guess that's about all. And if your wife, Darlene, decides to uh, rearrange the furniture. Does that work pretty well for you? 
Oh, sure. Now, you know, that's that's one of the big things people do, though. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so if people rearrange the furniture and do not tell the person who is visually impaired or has trouble getting around that they're rearranged, that can cause a real problem. And that happens in, in home, especially with maybe parents and children. They forget to tell the, the parent that they rearrange the children, and that's really hard. Rearrange the furniture, yeah, definitely. With, uh, thank you. Um, what has given you pride in your accomplishments? Well, I'm proud that I can read Braille as well as I can. I'm proud that I, I belong to a lot of singing groups. I'm proud that I can do that. And I'm proud that I can uh, communicate with people. And I'm uh, proud that I can play cards because I play bridge <clears throat> and um, a month ago, I won, and then last week, I got the booby prize. <laughs> but I'm proud. That, I'm proud that I can remember things. And um, one thing that I have, if you know, one thing people may mistake is, I'm proud that I can recognize voices. But people will talk to you you haven't seen for five or ten years. Say, do you know who I am? Or they'll honk the, their car horns. I say, did you hear me honk the horn? I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Richard, that happens to a lot of us now. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm proud, oh, I better say, I'm proud I served uh, serve in organizations like DAT, and well, I was on the, I was on the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Vision Impaired for about oh, 20 years, and I'm I'm proud of serving on those organizations and. <clears throat> I won't tell you what else because it. I'm, I was proud of being belonging to the Democratic Party, but I. You can ignore that if you're not a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay, we appreciate your honesty, and your last question I'd like to ask is: What is the most important message you want people to know about living with vision loss? Uh, think positive that you are able to do things. For instance, um, I have to in, discipline myself and learn and say that I can use the iPhone and able to use it because I, you get in your mind you can't do things. And I think you have to stay positive. Otherwise, you develop fears and barriers that could stop you in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stay positive. That is... Uh... Uh, an excellent point for each one of us, Richard. Thank you. And uh, Katie has a comment for you. I learned recently that there are different types of Braille. Perhaps you guys can talk briefly about that. Well, <clears throat> there's grade one Braille, which is totally no, it's all, no signs are all letters or words. Grade two Braille has, um, there's different signs which make it, because if, if it's grade one, you'd have hundreds of pages for book. Grade two uh, Braille has many signs and convenient uh, word signs and things, so it can decrease the, um, the, time, the page numbers. There's grade three Braille, but I don't know if that's used anymore. I had a book on grade, and that's real short form notation, but actually you can form your short form notation, really don't need to learn that. Uh, people do that they, if they want to take notes and form uh, different uh, economic, you know, they decrease, use words and use consonants in the words and use their own notation. But there's two grades of Braille, one and two. Thank you. And... I think one point that Denise shared with us earlier was that uh, since most of us, since our country is an aging population, it's important for each one of us to be aware of what we're dealing with as far as um, our vision and our hearing, our balance, and to respond accordingly uh, and I was thinking how important it would be to learn Braille, 
or um, to learn sign language so that if that time, if you need that, I wish I had that for my mom now who's in the, uh, the nursing home and uh, is not able to hear well. So I think we, oh, I'm sorry. we each have to be aware of our own individual situations and the reality of what's ahead for us. Richard, go ahead. Finish the hardest up. thing to give up for an older person is, of course, driving. Some people really have have difficulty. My dad should have quit. He didn't quit. He finally did, but he couldn't drive very well. My mother to tell him where to go. Yeah, makes you a little bit nervous, doesn't it, with all of the rest of us on the road? Oh, okay. Um, we have just a couple minutes. If anybody else has a question for Richard. Hey, Richard, it's Vicki. I just wanted to say thank you for your words of wisdom to stay positive because I guess we need to learn to embrace that, that technology instead of run away from it. But thanks for those words of wisdom there, Richard. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Yeah, and then another reminder that I heard was, don't be afraid to respond or uh, introduce yourself to a person who has some vision loss or total vision loss, that uh, the, the communication is so vital to their, uh, to their reality. And so, um, it's really, it's really important that we can. We yeah, Jean, Jean, this is Denise. I'll pick up on that. It really, it's so wonderful when I am out walking either for pleasure or getting to where I need to go and I encounter someone on the sidewalk and they just say to me, hello. And it not only feels warm and kind, it's also incredibly helpful because it gives me a spatial sense of where they are compared to where I am, so I can navigate safely around them. As you saw in the video, I'm a, I'm a cane user. Um, and it, so it's just those kinds of things or um, you know, someone just um, seeing that I might need some help, just saying, hey, it, would you like any help? You know, not, take, not taking over or grabbing my arm, which I have had that experience, but just you know, that offer and then it gives me the opportunity to say, yeah, I could really use help right now. Or it gives me the opportunity to say, no, thanks. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. But I got this. So those simple, simple things, you know, um, really are very powerful. And if you're a parent or if you're a grandparent and you're out with your little ones, you know, letting them be curious about people with disabilities is so powerful because, their curiosity is just simply coming from a natural place and answering their questions or letting them ask the other the person. I've had kids walk up to me and they're like, so what's that? What's that cane? Doesn't look like a cane, you know, because my cane is white and red. And so I'll explain the cane and how I use it for mobility and orientation and, you know, language that they can understand. And then they move on and they're all good. And, you know, but sometimes parents will say, Shh, you shouldn't ask her that question. And I'm like, no, you absolutely should ask me that question because then I can just normalize this experience rather than having it be taboo or something we don't talk about. So yeah, Jean, thank you for naming that, that reaching out with your voice is very powerful. And the normalization, the more we can do that with all the areas, no matter whether physical or um, gender issues, um, racial issues, that's what we're all working for. Okay, Amy, Denise. we have, we're ready for the next slide now. Um, what can I do? We've talked a lot about that during, throughout this program, uh, looking to support people with disabilities in our community. Here's how, uh, as uh, Denise has said, the Wisconsin Council for the Blind uh, updated information and the advocacy opportunities, they're marvelous on there. 
There's an organization out of Beloit that's called Retire RSVP, Retired and Senior Volunteer Program. You have to be 55 years or older, and you have to have your driver's license. But uh, you can be a, a great help to community members just to help them out with their basic needs, like to the doctor or shopping, or there's so many opportunities that RSVP can give you. APTIV is uh, services, helps for children and adults uh, to help with people, uh, to help them live more independent lives. Uh, number four, I think is just so major right now, our local politicians. We've talked about the state legislature. Um, please uh, step out of your comfort zone if you're like me. This is one area that I really need to do. And uh, uh, Tina has presented uh, a website for that. And then as Denise said, be aware of changes and um, take early in intervention steps when you realize there are some needs. Okay, next slide, please, Amy. Oh, <laughs> I. And we also uh, are encouraging youth to join our diversity action team programs. And so we have focused in on some other ideas that they can participate in. Um, tune into your own biases towards disabilities. And I would say for adults and for the teens, um, have you learned anything? Um, has that changed your, your um, bias? I like this one, join or form a club at your school to help your peers with disabilities. Uh, Beloit College has an excellent one. So think about taking that next step. Read books that have people with disabilities as the main characters. And then the last one, as Denise said, notice something, say something. Um, physical access barriers, the pedestrian signals, um, and then go to the people who can make the difference, make the change for you. Okay, and Amy, we have one more slide for our next steps. Our announcements. Uh, the recording of this program will be posted on Hedberg Public Library YouTube channel, and I believe also on DAT under the playlist. Um, check our website or your pardon any of our partners' Facebook pages for upcoming events, and then we have the following ones that we'd like to recommend. Courageous Conversations, Monday, October 25th, from 5.30 to 7. And that will be dealing with the history and the immigration challenges for the Haitian people. Excellent topic right now. DAT November program is um, boarding schools for Native Americans, that history. Uh, and that will be in person at the Hedberg Public Library. And that's also from 6 to 7.30. So there is a little bit of a time difference between Courageous Conversations and our monthly programs. Um, we'd also like to mention the YWCA Racial Justice Conference. That is an amazing experience. Fantastic speakers this year please go on the YWCA Facebook page to, um, to register for that event. So if any of you would like to print out the chat, uh, I'm not exactly sure how to do that. Okay, Amy, can you help me with that? Sure. So if you select chat from either the bottom or the top of your screen, depending on how your computer is laid out, a white rectangular column will appear on the right side. And if you look at the bottom right of that column, there are three gray dots. 
If you click on those dots, it should give you um, a list of options. And that first one is save chat. Now, um, that will save to your computer, um, depending on what type of device you're using. I'm not exactly sure where it will save on your device. Um, but if you have a finder feature on your computer, you can always type in Zoom and then the options will come up and you should be able to find the chat from this evening. My eight track tape player has none of these features. <laughs> <laughs> what <Bill>. three dots? <laughs> what three dots? I'll email it to you, Billy Bob. <laughs> I'm Thank sorry, you. Amy. It's I, you have to do this every month. Send me the. <laughs> we'll come to your house to work with you, Billy Bob. All A right. Private lesson. We uh, we'd just like to thank each one of you for participating, for being uh, with us, and if you would like to share this uh, this program. Go to the Hedberg Public Library uh, website, YouTube website, and you'll be able to find it. I'd also like to thank Denise, Jess, once more for your fabulous sharing. Thank you so much. Yay. <laughs> thank you and so much. Richard, thank you yeah. too. Richard, and so good to hear from you. It brings the reality very close to home too. And we, uh, when we have a, a special member who's with us. So thank you. Thank you, Amy, for being there all the time for us. We appreciate yeah. you greatly. All right, uh, Tina and Tina Markstead and um, Richard and Darlene uh, Johnson and I were, uh, we had a great time working together with Denise on this program. So. Thanks again, and I uh, hope you all can join us for Courageous Conversations Monday or for the, uh, the program next month. Thanks. <laughs>